and we will be studying, continuing our study in the book of 2 Peter and should be able to finish it this morning. Those of you that are on YouTube and Facebook, we appreciate you tuning in. And whenever you have the opportunity to tune in, we encourage you to do so. And if you live in the area or are traveling the area, we encourage you also to come and visit with us. Also, if you have any questions, whether in the audience or YouTube or Facebook, please let us know what they might be. Nothing we look more forward to than to give an answer for the faith that is within us. Our order of schedule of services, we start off Sunday mornings. We have a television program entitled What is True on Channel 42, KARZ in the Little Rock area at 8 o'clock, 9.30 Bible worship, Bible study hour. Then we'll be tuning in again at 10.30 this morning for worship service and again at 5 p.m. for another opportunity to worship God. And we meet at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings for another opportunity for Bible study. Before we begin our study, let us start off with a word of prayer. Most righteous Heavenly Father, we come to thee now, thanking thee for this, another day of life that we have been granted. We thank thee also for all the many spiritual blessings that we have been blessed with. Most of all, that great and matchless gift of thy Son dying on the cross for our sins, giving us that hope of eternal life if we but obey thy will. We also would be remiss, dear Lord, if we didn't. Acknowledge all the physical blessings that we've been blessed with. We recognize we live in a land of plenty and are our most blessed people. We pray for wisdom, Lord, in using these blessings wisely, recognizing they are gifts from you and that we are to use them to spread your word to the best of our ability to save souls. This time, dear Lord, each of us come to you searching our lives and searching our hearts for any sins we may have committed since we last stood justified in thy sight. As we confess these wrongs to you at this time and repent of them, we pray that we may be forgiven. So nothing may hinder our prayers to you at this time, nor our worship. And so that we may once again stand pure and justified in thy sight. Dear Lord, we also pray for those that are sick. We have some members and some members' loved ones that are in serious illness conditions this morning. And we pray that you will look down upon them with tender mercies, dear Lord. Be with those that are taking care of them. Grant them skill and wisdom in doing so, dear Lord. And even touch them with your saving, healing grace, dear Lord, to be your will. As we begin this hour of study, dear Lord, we pray that you will bring me a ready remembrance of things I've prepared. Pray that they will fall upon good, good and honest hearts, and we may accept these words that are from your, from your word as your word, and follow them to the best of our abilities. If any errors are made, dear Lord, we pray that someone may speak up and correct them. All these blessings and thanksgivings and requests we make known to you at this time. With thy Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2. We'll get there in just a moment, but in order to keep the continuity up, a thought, I want to look at, again, repeat what we did last week and go through and continue on with what other synopses we had from, we studied last week also. Peter told them, he informed them they'd been granted a precious faith, something very valuable to them, something they should hold dear. Through the rich knowledge, may you be granted grace and peace. He then enlarges the meaning and blessings of this precious faith, wishing them grace and peace. But, but, there's something Somewhat a contingency on this grace and peace is found in the rich knowledge of Jesus. And we ask the question, how do we come in contact with this rich knowledge, or how do we acquire it? And we can easily turn to 2 Timothy 2.15, which it tells us to give diligence or study to show ourselves approved unto God. A word that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Through the rich knowledge granted us everything necessary for life and godliness. Oh, and by the way, everything, absolutely everything, pertaining to life and godliness can be found in the rich knowledge of Jesus. And again, any verses in Timothy that come to mind when we consider everything pertaining to life and godliness, and you can look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished into every good work. 
become partakers of the divine nature. One of the goals of these verses is to become partakers of the divine nature. So through this rich knowledge of Jesus, we know what characteristics define the divine nature. And if we have forgotten, Peter lists them for us. But before we get to the divine characteristics, Peter gives an imperative. It is absolutely necessary for us to make every effort in verse 5. Not just a sporadic, now and again effort, but a continually striving effort, diligently working at it. Add to your faith, excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly affection, and unselfish love. We have our faith, our precious faith. Now we are to add to it excellence. It's Christian manliness and active courage in the good fight of faith to do what is right. Then we add knowledge to our arsenal. He's already told. It is through this knowledge we have grace and peace. Through this knowledge we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. And as we come to the next Christian graces, we have an understanding of them, the knowledge of them both mentally and what we need to actively do to have them become a part of our character. Next, we add the self-control, denoting self-government, discipline, and the ability to control one's own life. Perseverance is next, which includes the idea of positive resistance of evils and a steadfast bearing up under them. The person who has self-control, self-discipline, is able to patiently endure the trials of life. When times get difficult, we persevere, not to let the difficulties of life dismay us and cause us to fall. Next is godliness. Godliness is humble reverence and deep piety towards God. When we recognize what God has done for us, whether God the Father sacrificing his only son for us, or God the Son going through the torture and crucifixion for us, it should give us pause and bring us back to humble reverence and deep piety towards God. Next is brotherly kindness, a warm-hearted affection leading one to prefer the brethren. When we recognize we are all in this together, we are to lean on each other. And again, that means sometimes you are the leaner and sometimes the leanee. And finally, unselfish love, the Greek word agape, the love that is self-sacrificing, putting others' needs ahead of our own. Continually increasing keep you from becoming ineffective and unproductive. Along with the previous verse that tells us to make every effort, now we have to remind her there is no end point. We are to be continually increasing, and the result of doing so is that we will not become ineffective and unproductive. Well, I ask the question, is there a retirement clause here or anywhere else? Is there a time to say, it's your turn? I've done my time. As long as Peter is alive, he intends to remind him of these things. It is, it, 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 excuse me, it is his duty. Not only is he going to keep, them, keep reminding them, he considers it his duty to leave them a written record of these teachings, especially since he recognizes his end is near. And he wants to remind them, and does, remember, he was an eyewitness to Jesus' grandeur as he mentions the transfit Mount of Transfiguration. Also, remember, you have the prophets to rely on also. Their words were not of their own imagination, but came directly from God. You will need all this information I have provided you. False prophets are soon to come in among you and spread destructive heresies. All this information I've been giving you is not only for growth, but for defensive purposes. These false prophets, they will exploit you in their greed, and many will follow their debauched lifestyles. False prophets are going to work to exploit you. Peter tells them, remember these examples. God did not spare the angels. God drowned the ancient world. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. But remember, God saved Noah and seven others, and God saved Lot. God will save those who remain faithful.
Since God did the previous, he will again rescue the righteous from their trials. He will again punish the unrighteous. God's characterization of these evil men, brazen and insolent, <clears throat> irrational animals, corrals in broad daylight, indulging in deceitful pleasures, and they feast among you. These are men that will be among you with these characteristics and exploit you if you let them. Eyes full of adultery, never stop sinning, entice the unstable, greed set in their hearts. As in Peter's day, look at the false prophets throughout history, two main drivers for their action and money, for their actions, money and adultery. Look throughout, men establish new religions, what do they have? Give so that you can gain. Or they have religions stating that you can have multiple wives. You look at Islam, you look at Mormonism. This is the same thing back in Peter's day. God's characterization of these evil men, cursed children, the bottom line, cursed children. Here's where we stopped last week, and we'll pick up. These men are waterless spring and mist driven by a storm for whom the utter depths of darkness have been reserved. Unfortunately, we did stop here last week from the latter half of verse 10 to verse 16. Verse 17 through the end of this chapter carries on the same topic. False teachers coming in among the church and leading others astray. Calling them brazen and insolent or bold and showing a rude and arrogant lack of respect. Compares them to irrational animals, wild beasts meant to be caught and destroyed. Leading others to destruction will be destroyed themselves, will suffer harm for the harm they are doing to others. They have no shame left in them. Obviously full of spots and blemishes, yet they are still deceitful and are still among the Christians. Never stop sinning and working to entice the unstable others to sin. They're trained for greed. Money and pleasure combined in their greed. They make a choice. They forsook the right path. They knew right and wrong, but they preferred the wages of sin, the pleasures of sin, over living godly. Peter now uses the metaphors that were easily understood and appreciated in the first century. If you wanted and needed water, you went to a well. It typically took arduous effort to lower a substantial bucket down to the well and then draw it back up. Then to your dismay, you find it empty. Farmers look at the clouds praying for and expecting the needed rain. Imagine the thirsty man with parched throat and dismay with his dismay when the buckets come up empty. Chances are that if the well is dry, the others close by might be also. So hopefully, you can make it to the next well that does have water. Your life actually depends on it. Farmers expecting the rain in order to water their crops to ultimately feed their families. When the rain doesn't come, the dismay is magnified with potential crop failure. The very food he was going to sustain his family with. These false teachers are compared to these empty promises. They promise the equivalent of life giving water from the story, from the well, and from the rain. Is there any story that comes to mind that sheds light on the value of wells, the water they produce, and the labor involved? Moves nation, you know, a well of water would move the nation. You know? Well, okay. What am I thinking about? You're not doing a good job mind reading, Dennis. You're mind reading. You're mind reading. Jacob, possibly. Let's go to John four thirteen. The Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus replied, "Everyone who drinks some of this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks some of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again." But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. This just shows the magnitude, the significance of water back in those days. This woman wanted the water. She didn't have to go and crank that well that bucket up again and lower it back down again. It's very significant. Show what the me how the significant this 
metaphor is to the people in Peter's day. And their punishment is reserved for them, utter depths of darkness. Literally, in the Greek, it's utter darkness of darkness. Remember back in verse 4 of this chapter, the angels that sinned were cast into utter darkness. These false teachers have a relatively worse condemnation proclaimed on them, with the utter darkness of darkness being their final residence for eternity. Verse 18, for by speaking high-sounding but empty words, they are able to entice with fleshly desires and with debauchery, people who have just escaped from those who reside in error. Peter continues his diatribe against the false teachers, really stating in another way what he's already stated in previous verses in this chapter. In verse 3, exploit with deceptive words. Verse 14, entice unstable people. Empty words. Verse 17, wells without water, clouds without rain, fleshly desires of debauchery. Verse 2, many will follow their debauched lifestyles. In verse 10, those who indulge their fleshly desires. In verse 14, pleasure to carouse in broad daylight. Verses 14, the eyes full of adultery. The ones that are most likely to entice are the ones mo most likely to be enticed are the ones most vulnerable, the ones who have just escaped. I read, read this as the newly converted, and the Greek reads those barely escaping. Again, those most vulnerable. Verse 19, although these false teachers promise such people freedom, they themselves are enslaved to immorality. For whatever a person succumbs to, to that he is enslaved. This is just a continuation of the previous verse. Their high-sounding, empty words promise freedom. Misusing the Apostle Paul's words of the saints being granted freedom, surely not mentioning Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? Whichever lifestyle you choose to live, you are its slave. You're either God's slave or sin's slave. In opposition to the thought that the gospel provided freedom from the consequences of sin, Paul states unequivocally it results in death. And Peter states, whichever one you give yourself over to, that is your master. For if after they have escaped the filthy things of this world through the rich knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again get entangled in them and succumb to them. Their last state has become worse for them than their first. The antecedent of the word they are the false teachers of verse 19. This verse tells us that the false teachers previously had escaped sin through the rich knowledge of Jesus. As we described in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, rich knowledge is from the Greek, Greek word epinosis, not gnosis, meaning a complete in-depth working knowledge of Jesus and his gospel. This is truly scary when you think about it. The ones that will lead the new converts away are the ones that know the word very well. But they have gone back into the world, maybe not apparent to everyone just yet, and again got entangled into the filthy things. Filthy may be better translated defilements, pollutions, and contaminants, contaminations. They have surrendered to them. They have become enslaved to them. Peter states that they are now worse off than before they became Christians. Why is that? Before, they maybe didn't have a knowledge that what they were doing was wrong, or surely did not recognize the punishment of their practices. Now they knew what the punishment was and still totally disregarded it. <clears throat> for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than, having known it, to turn back from the holy commandment that had been delivered to them. And following up with that thought, Peter explains, it would have been better for them to have never known the holy commandment, the gospel and the moral commandment, than to have known and accepted and turned back from it. There are illustrations of this true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing herself, wallows in the mud. Now Peter lays it out so anyone can understand it. These men, similar to a dog that has vomited something that was not agreeing with it, they had left the contaminations of the world. The dog returns to a vomit which contains what made him sick. The false teachers return to their sinful lives, that which had made them spiritually sick. This is a loose translation of 
Proverbs 26, 11, like a dog that returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Peter provides another metaphor, the hog, after being washed, returns to its mire, a muddy, boggy area. The part that states after washing herself can just as accurately be translated after allowing herself to be washed. Why might Peter have used these two animals to illustrate his point? The dog and the pig. I didn't hear you completely. You're correct. I want a little bit of here. Speak up, please. The Gentiles were opposed to the dogs and the pigs, and they were the worst animals taken to The Jews could consider, referred to the Gentiles as dogs and pigs. They were considered the worst animals. They were both considered unclean by the Jews and were despised since they were scavengers, feeding off whatever animal had died. Dear friends, chapter 3, verse 1, this is already the second letter I've written to you in which I am trying to stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. This is the fourth time in this letter that Peter uses the term, dear friends, beloved in the King James American Standard Version. As we have studied the letter, we recognize Peter's strong feelings for them with the strength and urgency of his writings. He is adamant with what they should do and provides vivid, harsh descriptions of those who will work to draw them away. This fits Peter's personality, intense and somewhat times impulsive. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, who spoke up? It was Peter, let us build three tabernacles. And who drew a sword and chopped off the ear in the garden? It was Peter. Also, he recognizes his end time is near and does not want to leave them without warning and encouragement of what was to come. In the Greek, the term translated already the second letter I've written you, written you is literally translated this epistle already a second one I write unto you. Peter is acknowledging this letter is coming right after the first one. He next states his reason for writing this second letter. He's trying to stir them up, stir up their pure minds with reminders. And pure is what can, is that which can bear to be judged in the sunlight. And so means pure, clear, according to another possible etymology, unmixed, and so genuine and sincere. This is what the Christian mind should be, what Peter was expecting of those who received his letter, and what would or will benefit from it. If you're not genuine and sincere in your motives, you will not easily accept this letter. It tells us we have to work in gaining knowledge of Jesus' words and work at gaining and increasing the Christian graces. Who has time for that these days after working a 40 hour plus week and raising kids and relaxing? But I do not find any caveats in these letters or elsewhere. And Peter's not claiming to provide them something new. This is solely as a reminder. I want you to recall both the predictions foretold by the Holy Prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Peter uses the word reminder in verse 1, now uses the word recall. He wants them to recall the prophecies of the Old Testament, remembering those that foretold the coming Messiah, to provide a confidence that all that happened was known by God beforehand. Also, if they are true, then we cannot legitimately cast aspersions on the rest of the Old Testament. And also remember the commandment of Jesus that was brought to them through their holy apostles. First question that comes to my mind, is the word commandment singular, and if so, which specific commandment? What commandment could have Jesus given his apostles? A commandment, but be all encompassing. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And does Jesus' commandment to his apostles stop of baptizing and making them disciples? No. In verse, tw verse 20 of Matthew 28, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Teaching them to obey what? Everything. Not just the letters in red, but everything that Jesus has taught the apostles. One other 
take away from this verse? Who established most of these churches in all likelihood? More than likely is Paul, who he's writing, established the churches who Peter's writing to. This is also as an affirmation of Paul's apostleship. Verses 3 and 4. Above all, understand this, in the last days, blatant scoffers will come, being propelled by their own evil urges, and saying, where is this promised return? For ever since our ancestors died, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, Peter seems to be warning them of scoffers from the outside. Remember, we've covered the ones from the, coming from the inside. Previously in chapter 2, he warned them against false teachers within the body. You have to watch out for false teachers from the inside. Also, there will be those from the outside that try to make you doubt the second coming. Their motivations will be the same as the false teachers, evil lust. They are not able to take advantage of you due to your morality based on the eternal reward. So they try and dissuade you of the notion of any such thing. Ever since our fathers died, all things have remained the same. Where is this end of the world thing you speak? Everything has been the same since the initial creation. Being honest, it is kind of hard to prove something that has not happened. And Paul comforts his right, his readers with the mention of eternity, such as in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. To the casual reader, Paul is stating to the Corinthians, those that though some have died, though some have died, we are not all going to die. <coughs> Paul again in 1 Thessalonians 4.15 For we tell you this by the word of the Lord that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will not surely go ahead of those who have fallen asleep. One could easily infer from this verse if you receive this letter in Thessalonica all of us still living will not go ahead into the heaven before those that have died. And one could infer some of us might just be around when that second coming occurs. But Peter addresses these arguments. In verse 5, for they deliberately suppress this fact that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago, and earth was formed out of water and by means of water. Peter begins his defense in lieu, his defense in lieu of this argument. First, for men, these facts are willingly ignored. Literal translation, for this escapes them of their own will. The facts are there for them to examine. First, things have not always been the same. God created land out of the water. Through these things, the world existed at that time was destroyed when it was deluged with water. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire, of being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now, through that creation, the world continued to exist, but was destroyed by the very water it was created from in the flood. Now, by that very same word, that creative and destructive force behind it brought, brought it back together, back to life. This very same heaven and earth exist and is reserved, preserved for the time when it will be consumed by fire and the destruction of the ungodly in that day of judgment. Verse 8. Now, dear friends, do not let this one thing escape you, escape your notice that a single day is like a thousand years with the Lord. A thousand years are like a single day. Peter answers this question concerning the delay of Jesus' return with a virtual repeat of the Old Testament scripture in Psalms 92 through 5. <laughs> Even before the mountains came into existence, or you brought the world into being, you were the eternal God. You make mankind return to the dust and say, return, O people. Yes, in your eyes, a thousand years are like yesterday that quickly passes, or like one of the divisions of the nighttime. You bring their lives to an end, and they fall asleep. Peter, in repeating this thought from the Psalms, hopefully will extinguish any thoughts anyone would have trying to make this a literal time frame. Peter is saying, God is different. He doesn't measure time like man does. When you've been around for eternity, a few millennia is but a few grains of sand in the hourglass. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some regard slowness, but is being patient toward you because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Furthermore, this, in man's eyes, seeming delay has a purpose. 
a purpose to benefit man. He is giving man more time to repent. He is not being slow in fulfilling his promise, but exhibiting his patience. Inherit in this giving man time to repent is a duty for us, providing men the knowledge they need to recognize their need to repent. Look at this verse. What two tenets of Calvinism are refuted in this very argument? Pre-selection. God has not pre-selected those that would be saved, has he? God's giving them more time so they can repent. You're not pre-selected before the beginning of time, so and so and so and so, and you and you will be saved, and you and you and you will not. God's giving them time for these people to repent. Also, man can fall away. Once saved, always saved. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. When it comes, the heavens will disappear with a horrific noise. And the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze. And the earth and every deed done on it will be laid bare. Peter now answers thoughts that might be going through their minds. Okay, it could easily be thousands of years before Jesus returns, so I don't have to straighten up my life just yet. Peter now tells him, don't get the wrong idea from the previous sentences. The return of Jesus will be like a thief in the night. In other words, always be prepared. And when it happens, it will be virtually instantaneous. All the elements will melt away and vanish with a horrific noise. You'll notice that there is a significant difference in the end of this verse between the NET, which is what I use, and the King James and American Standard Version. Reading the side note on the translation of the NET just Kind of confused me more, but once I read the pulpit commentary and Wood's commentary, I believe the King James and American Standard Version are more correct. If we read the NET as the correct translation, we have the earth spared complete incineration, and it and all of men's, man's works laid before God, which doesn't mesh with other verses saying the heavens and the earth will be done away with. <coughs> Verse 11, since all these things are to melt away in this manner, what sort of people must you be? Conducting your lives in holiness and godliness. Developing his thought from the previous verse, Peter now states, Since everything is going to melt away, God is going to destroy everything, what kind of people do you think you should be? The NET uses the imperative must, while the King James and the American Standard use the word ought to be. Must, the imperative, seems to be more, most accurate based on the meaning of the original Greek word translated to be in the King James and American Standard. The Greek word is emphatic, which denotes original, essential, continuous being. The phrase manner of person would be more accurately translated of what country are you to be from. This goes back to 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter refers to Christians as strangers and pilgrims. What country of citizenship we are manner of life to know? If it is a citizenship in heaven, it will denote, it must denote, one that conducts their life in holiness and godliness. While waiting for the hastening, while waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of this day, the heavens will be burned up and dissolved, and celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze. This verse is a continuation of the sense from verse 11. Peter seems to be asking them a rhetorical question. What sort of person should you be? Even answering it, conducting themselves in holiness and godliness, while you're waiting for and even hastening the day of the Lord. The phrase hastening the day can have at least two different meanings. One is that their lives of holiness and godliness will bring about the coming of the Lord sooner. The other meaning is that they are urging it to occur. I would tend to agree with the second meaning because it seems to me the second coming is is going to come when there are few, if any, living righteously anymore. And with the second, and with the coming persecution, they would be urgently praying for the relief from the torturous deaths that were to come, but end with the second coming. Peter then repeats himself, stating that all the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze, as they're repeating of the reason they must live lives of holiness and godliness. Verse 13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness truly resides. In opposition to incineration of the heavens and the earth, children of God, Christians, 
have a promise of a new heaven and new earth, which we are waiting for. We are not fearing the incineration of the old. Instead, we are looking forward to the establishment of the new, where righteousness truly lives based on his promise. Therefore, dear friends, since you are waiting for these things, strive to be found at peace without spot or blemish when you come into his presence. Since we are waiting for these things, strive to try very hard to do something to make something happen, especially for a long time or against difficulties. In the King James and American Standard, be diligent, characterized by steady, earnest, and energetic effort, painstaking effort. We're to keep trying very hard to make it happen for a long time, even against difficulties, even if it's painstaking, to be found at peace with God and man and without spot, undefiled, and blemish or blameless, not condemned. So how do we accomplish this? We go back to the first of the book, put on the Christian graces by striving, by diligently trying very hard to make it happen even if it takes a long time and you face great difficulties, be energetic, earnest, and steadfast. Verse 15. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our dear brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, speaking of these things in all his letters. Peter tells them, in regards to the delay of the second coming, to look at it differently than the heathens do. They looked at it as, it must not be going to happen. They were to look at it as more time for salvation, for themselves and for all whom they could reach with the gospel. Just as Paul had written to them, which most believe is a reference to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he tells them how to live, not to worry about those that have already died missing the second coming, and then describing the second coming. Second part of verse 16. Some things in these letters are hard to understand, things the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they also do to the rest of the scriptures. Here Peter acknowledges that some, not all, of Paul's writings are difficult to understand, which the ignorant, the unlearned, and unstable, those without firm convictions, twist, they distort, to their own destruction, literally their own destruction of themselves. And it's not just Paul's writings that do this to The rest of the scriptures are at their disposal to twist and distort. Brother Wood's commentary brings up some key points I believe we always need to keep in mind. The destruction which results is due not to the scriptures or writers, but to the improper hand, handling, but to the improper handling by men. The passage does not teach that all scripture is difficult to. That should be the The destruction of the scriptures, the, the twisting of the scriptures, which results is due not to the scriptures or writers, but to its improper handling of means. Apologize for that. The passage does not teach that all scripture is difficult to understand and should not be read. It does not lend support to the view that man needs an infallible interpreter of the scriptures. What is taught is that some scripture is hard to understand and that evil men utilize such for ungodly purposes. The lesson by implication is that we should be guard on guard against any interpretation contrary to the general teachings of the Bible. These are all key points we need to keep in mind. Verse 17, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard that you do not get led astray by the error of, those, of these unprincipled men and fall from your firm grasp on the truth. Peter now sums up everything since you have been forewarned, always be on your guard. These unprincipled men, remember their principles were selfish lust. And if you are led away, you will fall from your firm grasp of the truth. Verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the honor both now and on that eternal day. In opposition to being led away from the truth, Peter tells them, but grow. In the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is how he started this epistle. And as a close, Peter reminds them of all the honor belong, all the honor belongs to him now and all of that eternal day. This will wrap up our study of Second Peter. I 
My goal has been to make it so it, you understood what Peter wrote in those days and to bring the application to our days. I hope it has been a benefit to you. Hope you come back and join us again at 10.30 for our morning worship.